missed you all for the past couple of weeks, but we are so excited to be back with a very special guest. She's been ranked as high as number two in the world. She was the 1994 Wimbledon singles champion, a five-time Fed Cup champion, a three-time Olympic medalist, and of course, a member of the Hall of Fame incoming class for 2020, Conchita Martinez. It is so great to see you. Great to see you too. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So you're coming to us from Geneva. For those of you, for those who don't know, can you explain why you're there and sort of what the past several months have been like for you? Well, I'm here. Uh, of course, I'm uh, coaching uh, Garbine Muguruza and she lives here. So I'm here to do a block of training uh, for her. Um, I'm going to be here for three weeks and sort of waiting to see what the, the news are going to be. I mean, apparently uh, things uh, look like they might happen in the in the States, like the, the Cincinnati tournament moving to New York, the US Open ho happening. So we're preparing for that. And um, I mean, it's been hard. Uh, as you know, when the, the tour got canceled, uh, we were in Indian Wells, so, so I got uh, I was with uh, with the whole team, and you know, we everybody went sort of uh, different places. I went to Spain. Arvinia came here. You know, uh, the fitness trainer is from Argentina. The physio is from Germany. So we sort of all moved to our places and kind of waited there. I mean, for sure, um, Spain and Argentina were very tough. We were, I mean, in Argentina they still in confined. Uh, in Spain, uh, for you know, there were some tough months there, you know, where you couldn't even leave your home. So, yeah. Well, we're going to talk more about uh, Garbinia a little bit later, but I've seen some video of your practices and you've had a special guest for a couple of them in Stan Bavrinka. What has he brought to the practice energy? Oh, well, he's, of course, uh, every chance we get to, to practice with uh, an ATP, ATP player, uh, we try, no? Uh, I mean, uh, they're amazing players, they're very consistent. So for, for Garbine, it was great to have that practice. Uh, of course, um, you know, we have a little fun too, which is great, uh, but it's also, um, you know, some hard work there and, um, it's, it's great. It's great to, to be hitting with these kind of players, of course. Good stuff. Well, Conchita, if, if things were, were quote unquote normal right now, we would be right in the middle of Wimbledon. And as a former Wimbledon champion, we have a little Wimbledon speed round for you. OK, so quick questions, quick answers. You ready? OK, I try. <laughs> OK, here we go. Describe in three words what it's like to walk out onto center court for a Wimbledon final. Three words. I don't know if I can do that, but it's <laughs> more is fine too. <laughs> Amazing feeling, happiness. You're in the final, so <laughs> any nerves? Nervous? Yes, of yeah, of course. I mean, every time uh, you play a match or you play a, a final of a Grand Slam, uh, of course, sometimes it's, it can be different, though. Yeah. You know, sometimes you're more nervous than other times, uh, but yeah. Uh, Butterflies. Sure. Have you actually tasted and do you like strawberries and cream? Of course I did and I love them. All right. Who is the most famous person who's watched you play from the Royal Box? Princess Diana. Oh, what a good. privilege. That that's was a good great. one. Yeah. Wow. All right. What's more stressful, playing in a Wimbledon final or coaching in one as you did in 2017 with Garbinia? I think uh, coaching might be a little bit more stressful. Yeah. Oh, I can't imagine. <laughs> a lot of nerves. What was the most fun part of the Wimbledon ball? Um, well, to be there, to you know, to have uh, to have won the final and against an amazing player. I mean, you're just so happy. Uh, to be around with a lot of uh, other amazing champions there, it's uh, a very special feeling. Did you do any dancing? Uh, no, that year um, it, uh, Pete Sampras won, but it was kind of serious and there was no dancing involved yet. Already. All right. And finally, the most important question, where do you keep your trophy? I keep my trophy in my living room. Uh, so it's 
it's a replica, so it's not as big as I would like it to be, but uh, it is in a very special place where a lot of my trophies are. All right, well, Conchita, in addition to Wimbledon, we would also be coming up on your enshrinement weekend with Goron. The celebration is going to have to wait a year, but when you think about what that experience is gonna be like, what are you most looking forward to? Well, I heard only good things about it. I heard it's really, really special. Uh, it's a beautiful place uh, to have a, a chief, a ch a chief uh, to be there in the Hall of Fame is, it's a great achievement um, to be there with so many unbelievable names. It's gonna be um, very, very, very nice. And I'm gonna have some friends there. I'm gonna have uh, some family there, hopefully. I mean, that was the plan and I'm looking forward to it. All right, we have a little surprise for you speaking of enshrinement weekend. So the legends inducted into the Hall of Fame are honored in what we call the enshrinement gallery. So just as you walk into the museum in Newport, there are plaques about each of their lives and their careers in tennis. So including you and Goran, only 213 people have received that honor. And today we have the first look at your plaque, which is now officially on display in the museum. I love okay. <laughs> the slice backhand and the first line. I love it. Says you're a masterful strategist. What do we think? Well, um, you know, every time that I see these things, I get good fun. So I mean, it's very nice. I see that slice, and uh, you know, uh, I'm very happy with that with my game. I brought happiness to so many fans. Uh, of course, many nerves. Uh, you know, in all those years that I played, but, um, you know, it's very, very nice uh, to have these things. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. Well, I can't wait for you to see it in person. It's much better than on a piece of paper, I promise. <laughs> Me too. Me too. I cannot wait. <laughs> All right, so with that, I'd love to sort of go back to the very beginning when you first picked up a racket. So how old were you and who was responsible for first getting you to a tennis court? I was nine years old, which is uh, quite uh, late actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, in the place that we were living, Monzon is a very small uh, little town. And um, I, I guess I was lucky enough to, to live on the third floor of a building where I could see two tennis courts and I could uh, see people playing all the time. And one day, you know, I just went down there and I'm like, okay, this looks like fun. Uh, so I started, I picked up a, a racket, you know, we all know each other over there. And uh, I started play, uh, playing against the, the wall. There, is a, there was a little wall there. And I started playing and the coach, uh, I mean the coach, <laughs> from, I mean, it was like maybe his uh, second work. <laughs> uh, wow. so, and, and said, okay, to my father, you know, she, she looks good. I mean, I think, why don't you bring it to the school once a week? It was Saturdays, I remember. Wow. And so that's how, you know, it all started. And uh, from then on, you know, everything started. So which professional players did you look up to as a kid? Who did you watch? Well, um, we didn't have uh, much tennis on, on TV uh, those times, but I, I do remember uh, my, the players that I liked. At the beginning, it was, uh, you know, Martina Navratilova, of course, and uh, John McEnroe. I thought they were uh, fun players to watch, uh, probably because of, of their game. Not that, you know, I played uh, any game like they did because I never went to the net, but I don't know, it was fun for me. And, uh, and then I have other players that I was watching, but um, those two were stand up, yeah. So when you watched uh, John McEnroe on the court, you must have a little bit of that fire inside of you as well. Um, well, yeah, sometimes I, I did. I mean, I kind of like, um, outside of the court, I'm, I'm a very quiet person, uh, peaceful, but sometimes on the court, I transform myself. I used to do, and, you know, sometimes I got mad, sometimes, you know, but there was some fire there for sure. Sure, love it. Okay, we have a fan question coming in live on Facebook from Sue Silva. Who decided to teach you the one-handed backhand and would you coach a junior to have a one-hander today? Um, okay, um, it's actually a good story. I changed my two-handed backhand because I had a two-handed backhand. 
Really? And when I was 15, I, I moved to, to Switzerland, actually, uh, for a year and a half, two years uh, to train. And my two-handed backhand, it wasn't very natural. Uh, and it was kind of like not my best shot. My best shot was always the forehand. And it was not very aggressive. So, you know, one day I was uh, watching on TV uh, a match and it was there, Gabriela Sabatini playing. I, I don't remember who. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had, I had you know, a backhand like that. I love it. I mean, it was, it was wow. looking so beautiful. So my coach at the, at the time said, okay, next, I mean, next day, you know, we, we went to the practice court and he's like, okay, come on, let's try and hit some one-handed backhand. And it was so natural that he's like, okay, from now on, you're only hitting one-handed backhand. So I was Amazing. kind of like, so would you coach a junior today to have a one-hander? Um, I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, to have a two-handed backhand, sometimes that la left hand, it helps you. It's more powerful. I mean, with I would teach a two-handed backhand, but also to be, you know, to have a very good one-handed slice. So I would uh, take care of that. And so then there you have the variation. But to, to have a two-handed two backhand, you can be a little bit more aggressive there. Okay. Well, you mentioned training in Switzerland. Before you went to Switzerland to train, you left your home. I found this fascinating. At just 12 years old, so only three years after you started playing, you left your home in Monson to go train in Barcelona, and then 15, you moved to Switzerland. What did you feel about that, and what did your parents think letting their child go uh, and chase her dream? Well, I can tell you that my mother, my mom was not very happy. <laughs> uh, she was very mad at my dad. Um, I cannot like talk my dad into it. Um, look, I mean, it was my dream. Uh, I was uh, doing quite well. Um, you know, I was uh, having a lot of fun. It was my passion. And, you know, they kind of uh, let me follow my dream, which I really appreciate that. But of course, my mom was suffering a lot. I mean, uh, Barcelona was only three hours, and that's a lot, by train. Uh, but then Switzerland was another story because it wasn't like today where you can hop on a plane, like, um, you know, there is a lot of planes. I mean, at that time, it was they were very expensive, uh, and it was not that easy. So not that I could come every weekend. So it was that, for wow. sure. Well, the good news is it paid off because you turned pro at 16 in 1988, and then the following year, you won three titles, including the title in Tampa, where you beat Gabriela Sabritini, your one-handed backhand inspiration, yeah. in the final. And this is incredible. I was reading that you made your top 10 debut less than 15 months after debuting in the rankings for the first time. Did you expect, yeah. That, to, yeah, did you expect that success to happen that quickly? It was quite fast, let me tell you. Yeah, for sure, it was quite fast. Um, I started playing um, smaller tournaments, I, ITFs, and uh, I mean, at that time, there were like 10,000 tournaments where you had to play qualifying matches, like five of them, and then to win the tournament, another five, so after and after. But um, that's how I picked up my ranking. So it wasn't like, okay, we see this girl, we give her a walker, and uh, off you go. No, no, I feel that from from low to up, and, and it was, uh, yeah, it was quite uh, amazing, uh, and it was quite fast. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe a little surprising, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, like I said, I did it with a lot of passion. It was uh, something that I loved doing, and, you know, I keep, I keep getting better every time, so it was good. <laughs> All right, so let's fast forward then to 1993. You're 21 years old, you make the semifinals, at Wimbledon, how did you shift your mentality from the the grass is for cows idea, yeah, yeah. To really embracing grass as a, a Spanish clay quarter? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad I did, right? <laughs> because um, uh, grass is a very difficult uh, surface. I mean, it's not easy, and if you don't go with an open mind. Uh, and if you stay like, okay, you know, I cannot play it in the surface, uh, this is too hard, which uh, a lot of the times I did. Um, but um, it was, uh, yeah, 93, where, you know, after those semifinals, 
uh, I think the next year when I came, uh, I had a very open mind for for practicing before the the, the tournament and. Um, you know, just to be a little bit more accepting that uh, you're not going to play your perfect game. It's impossible because uh, you get quite uh, low bounces, uh, weird bounces here and there. So it's not going to be perfect. And if you accept those things and you're OK, uh, you know, like accepting that, then, you know, you get better and better. So, yeah, that's a little bit how it happened. And, and we saw it one year later in 1994. So I am so curious about your mentality. So you're walking out on the court for that Wimbledon final. You're playing a childhood idol going for her 10th Wimbledon singles title. What were you telling yourself as you were walking out on the court? And what did you tell yourself to close it out in the third set? Um, I was telling myself, um, I mean, Play Martina was uh, amazing to play her on 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 grass. Uh, that year, uh, I think I played her. I don't remember the, the the round that I played her in Rome, which was on clay, and I beat her in Rome. It was like a few months before uh, Wimbledon, and I felt actually quite confident that I was playing good. I mean, once you're in the final, I think the semifinals I played Laurie McNeil. It was like 10-8 in the third set and. I mean, I was really, really ready to play. I was uh, uh, passing well. I was playing well. The surface was playing good for me because it didn't rain that much that year. I think it was only that Monday. And so, you know, I just um, I just felt confident, confident. And like you asked me before, you know, if I was nervous, I was a little bit nervous, but not as nervous as some other times. So that helped me. And, and to close it out, you know, just to believe, to go for your shots and to just follow your routines. And that's what I did. We actually had a fan question come in about that match you mentioned with Lori. So he's oh, asking, yeah. from Patrick Cohesi. He's asking how you kept your composure in that classic semifinal. I don't know. I don't know. It just, it just happens. You know, it's like sometimes you're in a very good frame of mind. I mean, I really wanted to. To win uh, I was playing good uh, every match uh, of that championships uh, I was building up and I, I felt like I was a lot under pressure because Lori was serving and bowling she was coming into the net every chance she had so that puts a lot of pressure and then to hold yourself uh, yourself um, but um, you know just like I said, following your routines and believing in yourself is, is, is a big uh, big thing when you go and play a match. Lindsay Davenport joined us on Hall of Fame Live a few weeks ago. I think you know about this. We asked her who her toughest opponent was, and she said you. You guys played 17 times in your career. So we then had this fan question from Desmac73 on Instagram. Who was your toughest opponent? Uh, my toughest opponent, um, the one that I felt more uncomfortable many times was Monica Seles. Mm. And it was, Monica was one of the first players that came and changed a little bit the game. Um, it was, she was playing both handed from both sides. She was taking the ball very early. She wasn't giving you time for anything. She played those short angles with they were very hard for me. And on top of that, she was a lefty serve, so which I didn't really like. So yeah, I think Monica was uh, the toughest opponent for me. Rome was a place where you had a lot of success, four consecutive titles. When things were going well for you during a tournament, did you have a particular routine that you stuck to? Did you eat the same dinner every night? Did you wake up and do the same thing before a match? How did you sort of process when you were doing well? How did you know that? <laughs> just, just a hunt. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, I am sort of a little bit superstitious. <laughs> and yes, uh, Rome was one of my favorite tournaments, that's for sure. Uh, I tried to follow my routines and to do pretty much uh, similar uh, things. And mm -hmm. when things are working, why, why change them? No? Um, a couple of things that I would do in Rome, <laughs> because it's a city that I love. I remember uh, some players were staying in the official hotel, but I asked to be, uh, I stayed in one in the city where I, they were, it was right above the Spanish steps. And with that, I had my favorite restaurant, which I went pretty much every night. Uh, 
and and the name was Mario, which sadly last year I went and I wasn't there anymore. No. <laughs> yeah, but um, it was a wonderful family where you got in and they brought all the food that you wanted and, and it was amazing. And after that, uh, I walked to Fontana di Trevi. I had an ice cream, <laughs> so not very healthy to do all this. <laughs> and then what I did was to throw the coin into the fountain and ask for uh, you know, <laughs> perfect. So, so ice cream and a wish into the fountain. Yeah. That's the that's so that the was the secret. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic! I love. It. Well, I'm glad I asked that question because uh, it is. I mean, everybody sort of has their own things that make them yeah. comfortable, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you also had incredible success as part of a team. Five Fed Cup titles, three Olympic medals. How close are you with those those teammates today? In particular, we got a lot of questions about if you still keep in touch with Arancha and what your relationship is like today. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it was uh, amazing to play with uh, amazing players in my team. Uh, Arancha, I see her uh, often, uh, especially in the Grand Slams. Uh, she comes and plays the, the legends. Uh, I know she, she lives in, um, in Florida now, I think Miami. But, um, you know, sometimes we stay in touch, but mostly when we see each other at the Grand Slams. And the rest of the players, for sure, yeah, also the same. You know, when, when we see each other, uh, yeah, it's great. We, we keep great memories together. All right, here's a fan question from Judy003 on Instagram. I'm going to paraphrase here. Are there any young up-and-coming Spanish players that we should keep an eye on? Anyone that you've seen coming up? Uh, yeah, for sure. We, we have uh, some players. Um, yeah, I'm, I, one that I like is Paula Badosa, Sara Sorribes. They're not super, super young. Uh, now you put me in the spot because uh, uh, there was one that is uh, was born in Andorra, our, you know, our neighbor that, um, I, I forgot her name. She's gonna kill I know me, who but, you're uh, talking about and I can't help you either. But I know yeah, she did very well. See in the in the in the juniors there, so that's uh, that's great. And uh, I'm sure there is a lot more players. But right now, yeah, uh, the names, yeah. All don't right, come. all right. So you left home at 12, and then you retired at 34, and that leads us to our next fan question from Void RX Manoff on Instagram. What do you miss most about playing tennis after having dedicated so much of your life to the sport? Actually, uh, I don't miss anything because I often, you know, I'm in the core. I'm in the core coaching. I play for fun sometimes. Uh, so what I don't miss is the competition. So yeah. for me, it's fun. I've been always, um, you know, doing since I retired, I started uh, commentating. Uh, so I'm always together with tennis, you know, I never left uh, playing or coaching or commentating. Um, so, you know, I don't miss it because I'm, I'm very close to it. Cause you're yeah. So who's your practice partner when you get out and hit? Uh, who's my practice partner? Um, I play with some coaches. Okay. I play with some friends, uh, coaches and you know whenever i can i hit a couple of balls with garbina here and there you see if she's happy enough to hit me a couple of balls she's too powerful <laughs> but uh yeah and then when we play the legends uh like i have a lot of fun with uh with some of the uh the players uh of my my time you know like i play with barbara shed or Rene Stubbs or you know some of these players uh, for sure. Good. Well, I actually have an answer for you. Are you thinking of uh, Jimenez Casilla? Yes. yes, there you go. There we go. From indoor. Yes. Well, I had yeah. a little help. A uh, shout out to Anne Marie who helped me with that. But I remember watching her play at the juniors and she was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. So I think she's, I mean, she already did unbelievable. And it's nice to see some upcoming players that are going to do very, very well for sure. All right, so you talked about having stayed very close to tennis since your retirement, commentating, Fed Cup captain, Davis Cup captain, WTA coach, and of course you're back with Garbine and have had a, a great start to the year. We would have obviously loved to have seen how that continued through the middle parts of the year, but how are you preparing her for all of the different scenarios that could happen and what, how do you see the next few months playing out? 
Yeah, this is uh, uh, it's not easy. It hasn't been easy. It's not easy at all. But um, we are staying very active. It wasn't easy because, uh, like I said, um, Spain got all the borders got closed. Uh, so I mean, this is the first time we see each other since uh, March, uh, middle of March. Uh, but um, you know. The whole team, we are very united, United preparing her uh, with different things of fitness or tennis. Uh, she kept very active on the fitness side, um, some on the tennis. And now what we're doing is like, we're starting to play a little bit more tennis uh, together with fitness. And, um, you know, uh, for now, uh, what we have to be prepared is for all the tournaments that are coming. We don't know. I mean, for now, as I know, uh, they're going to be playing these tournaments. So we're preparing like uh, for the first tournament that we're going to play. And then um, then let's see for the for the news. We, we don't know because this changes every not every day, every every few hours. So right. we will be. I mean, it's, we're not in a very good place uh, right now. The world is is suffering, so it's, it's hard to see. Hopefully uh, we can play. Hopefully we can play because it's, it's it's our life, no. But you know, it's not up to us. So, well, on a much lighter note, Scarvinia has done some incredible dancing on TikTok. Do you watch <laughs> these videos? And any chance we get to see Conchita in one of the TikTok videos? Uh, not a chance. <laughs> you, not a chance. <laughs> No, no, no. We are, we often laughed about it. I mean, she's an amazing dancer, mm -hmm. and I have um, zero zero skills. So <laughs> no coordination for dancing. So now I'm not gonna put myself through that. That's for sure. <laughs> that's great. All right, another fan question from Paul Age on Instagram: What is the biggest goal you'd like to achieve as Garbinier's coach? Well, for sure. I mean. Uh, we work to you know to to win tournaments that's for sure i mean i'm i'm very happy uh, you know i haven't seen her for a while and this uh, first week i'm i'm very happy with the things i'm seeing uh she's hitting the ball great she's working amazing so yeah i mean in in tennis what you want to achieve uh, in in every tournament that you play is to to win uh and for sure you know uh aim for some some more grand slams uh, that would be amazing but uh, to make her a very complete player and to make her strong and you know stable fan question from facebook what's the secret of transitioning from being a great player to being a great coach well, i don't know i don't know if there is a secret <laughs> uh, i don't know i mean I would say one word is uh, passion. If you have passion with what you do, I mean, it a lot, it's a lot easier. Uh, like, uh, I love this sport. I love what I do. I'm happy when I step on the tennis court. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, passionate on the way I, I coach and see things. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm a great coach or was a great player. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm passionate and I'm happy doing what I'm doing. So uh, that helps a lot. I'd say it's worked out pretty well. Another fan question coming in as we're winding down. Did Martina make a mistake hitting to your backhand in your Wimbledon final? I mean, uh, I don't think it was a mistake. Um, I mean, the backhand stand out because normally my forehand uh, was way better. Better. And why were they hitting to my backhand to see if, uh, I, you know, I mean, it was sort of my, my weakest side. Uh, I think I was quite confident with the forehand and maybe she did that a few times and she knew and I, I felt more comfortable. Uh, I, was, I had the match of my life, so no matter, I don't know if she would have hit to one side or the other, it was going to be better. Good stuff. Well, in addition to being back as Garbinia's coach, you're also back as the Fed Cup captain. What qualities do you think tennis instilled in you that you would like to pass on to your players? Sorry to tell you, but I'm not the Fed Cup captain anymore. No, I finished. Oh. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm just uh, Garbines uh, coach at the moment. Okay. I okay. With 
uh, I think 17 was my last year. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I right, just. So uh, in yeah. so what would you like to pass on then uh, to Garbinia? and you know again i would assume that you will probably coach who knows other players down the road what would you like to pass on to them well i mean uh, one thing that is good uh, as being a past former player is that uh, you had the experience and that you know uh, pretty much <clears throat> you you've gone through what they they're going through at that moment uh before so with that i think you can help the help them a lot because you understand what they're going on uh, what they're going uh what is going on with them um so yeah i mean my experience in many uh, how you know i did things and, um but uh, um you know to be professional to be passionate and uh, and all of those things uh, uh i also read conchita in your wta profile again this is switching gears but i hear you like motorcycles I, is this do you spend some time I, I don't spend time anymore i have a couple of motorcycles i used to be a great uh uh, Davisons. I have one in San Diego. I have Donna. The one in San Diego, that is, uh, I don't get uh, much. The one in Barcelona, I use, and not, not that at all. Yeah. But I like, I like to see it and ride sometimes. Very cool. And and finally, Conchita, I'd love it if maybe you could leave uh, the fans who are watching today with your best bit of tennis advice. Is there something that has always sort of stuck with you that you could share with the viewers today? Sorry, but I lost you there. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. No, worries. Yeah, no that's okay. I just was wondering if you could leave us with your best bit of tennis advice, uh, a bit of advice that sort of works at all levels. Uh, I mean, uh, when you step on the court, uh, try to like uh, do this because you really love the sport. I mean, no pressure. I mean, the, the, I was lucky that I, have, I had a family that put no pressure on me. So be happy on the tennis court, smile a lot, and um, you know, just try to have fun uh, or not, have fun. <laughs> I like it. I'm I'm taking notes over yeah. here. Right. <laughs> Cheetah, it was such an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for, for the questions. Enjoy the rest of your time in Geneva. I certainly hope to see you soon. And thank you all for joining us for another edition of Hall of Fame Live. Make sure to check out our social channels uh, for information on our next guest and time. We'll see you then.